way, when you study the talent attempt, there has always been an attempt to emulate the white social structure, the white that political That is not values. true. I just completely well, disagree. Let me ask you this. Hold on. Hold on. Attorney. Let, attorney. Hold on one second. second. They're hating on black people because they succeeded. I'm not hating. Nah. I'm asking uh, hold you. on. What we have, have to go you to break. in your five sigma pi family done for black people? Yeah. What have you done for black people? Yeah. Uh, two distinguished gentlemen. Uh, what have you done for black people? Yeah. Two distinguished gentlemen. One, Dr. Umar Johnson. Dr. Johnson, how are you? Welcome to the show. Good morning. Good morning. And Dr. Johnson, he's a uh, doctor of clinical psychology and certified school psychologist um, who's considered an expert on the education and mental health of African and African-American children. So Dr. Umar Johnson. And um, also on the line is a attorney, Lawrence Otis Graham. He's author of the book, Our Kind of People. Inside America's Black Upper Class. Lord, Lord, Lord. Welcome to the show, Attorney Graham. How are thee? I'm fine, Ernest. Thanks for setting me up like that. I know the haters will come out. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start. here. This is where I would like to start, okay? And um, I'll start with you, Attorney Graham. What, how is the black elite defined? How do, how do I identify them? Well, I mean, without going into the pejoratives of it, the thing about it is that, that many people look at the black elite as being, or the black upper class, in, in many ways, is older money than, like, first-generation money or second-generation money. We're talking about people typically that, um, like when you mentioned vacation in Martha's Vineyard, um, it would be owned owns a home in Mars is in here because the distinction among that crowd is are you renting or are you owning, you know, and who is your family? These are people that, you know, whether, depending on where, where, where they're from, people that have ties to, as the, like Memphis or Chicago, like Supreme Life Insurance or Universal mm-hmm. Life Insurance, people that whose grandparents um, had gone to, you know, uh, medical school or, or um, where the question is basically they look at everything from, you know, how many generations of wealth are you? Did you grow up in Jack and Jill? Um, um, is, was your grandmother a mother in the links? Or was your grandfather a father in the boule? Or, or the guardsmen, these are just national old black organizations. Right. Um, people are bigoted uh, um, against other people. Well, unfortunately, the, the worst thing is when we turned against our own um, with the brown paper bag and ruler test. Right. Um, so there's there's a lot that, that comes in this. And then also, what school did you go to? Did you go to Morehouse, um, Howard, or Spellman? Or did you go to, you know, uh, and not even where you went, where you're, like I said, thought parents and grandparents and right. so forth. Dr. Johnson, how do you define, how, how is the black elite defined? Oh, uh, yes, sir. I say that when you deal with the black elite, you're looking at two different definitions. You're looking at the internally defined black elite, that is those who themselves identify as elite, and you have the externally defined black elite, which are those who are considered to be so by the outside looking in, whether that is the white sociologists, whether that is other black people. W.E.B. Du Bois in 1903 published his first essay on the talented 10th. And that essay was so powerful that by the next May 15th of 1904, right here in Philadelphia, we have the birth of Sigma Pi, which is the black boule and one of the most exclusive fraternities for black people in the world. And so coming out of oppression, we have to keep in mind, black people have always tried to escape oppression. Some tried to escape oppression by destroying it, and others tried to escape oppression by joining it. When we talk about the black elite, it has gained a negative connotation. The fact that you have academically and financially astute black professionals should be a good thing, because you would think they would reach back and help out, which was Bois' original conceptualization of the talented 10th. However, the further we've gotten away from slavery and the further we've gotten away from the civil rights struggle, you don't see the black elite reaching back to help the black working class or underclass. In many respects, they have become 
the gatekeepers for the white power structure. And that is why now they are viewed as a problem. Yeah, I think we may need to sort of sort of narrow or define the scope of the black elite. Right. First, I wanted I, I, I appreciate both of you. Uh, particularly, particularly Attorney Graham, you sort of went sh- straight to the top of the totem pole, right? The tip, you know, of the black elite, like Martha's Vineyard, second, third generation money. Don't just visit Martha's Vineyard, but actually own, you know, on the vineyard. So that right. black elite, and that's a world, I don't know, you know, what that world looks like. But then I think Dr. Johnson, you sort of took it down a bit, right? And then you're like, OK, there these there are these internally defined black elite who see themselves as black elite because maybe they are new money. They're not the type of money that attorney Graham alluded to or spoke about. But it's like, hey, I have a corporate job and I make two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. Black elite. Right. And so yeah. <laughs> in which you don't get accepted into some of these organizations. I mean, because these organizations are by the invitation only. These that have chapters around the country, and you have to be nominated by someone who is deeply within them. I mean, and these are people that are also, they're all professionals. They're people that have, um, you know, law degrees, um, MBAs, and, and not just from any schools, MDs. Let, let, me, let me ask you this question before we cross over to the other side. Sure. And, and this is just for the crowd, not for me, so to speak. How right. much are these people worth? Well, it, um, it, I mean, most of them that are legitimately within the group, it's not. I mean, it, it would be it, still 15, 20 million at least. And obviously beyond, well beyond that. But it's not just that. It's how long you've had Correct. the money. It's how long, you know, where's your family home? You know, how many generations? I mean, these are people that ask. And, 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 it's, and it's, how, it's how you made your money. Exactly. How you make your money. Absolutely. And it could be, and these are typically, you know, they could be judges. They, and because of be philanthropists, a lot of them are philanthropists because they've had the money in their mm-hmm. family for so long. Oh. And they don't just have their own money. They marry money. Yeah. Because that's what many of these children's organizations are intended to be. You know, when I was growing up, my expectation was I was going to marry somebody from Jack and Jill. And, you know, um, I grew up in New York. My, hey, my attorney wife, Graham, I have to cross the bridge and you marry well. <laughs> I know you yeah. ma- and you marry very well. <laughs> Let's let's cross. You know who my wife is. Yes, I do, right. sir. Right. Yes. Let's cross right. the bridge. Let's go over to Dr. Umar Johnson. Let's talk about this uh, black elite. Let's scale it down, Dr. Johnson. Let's talk about the brother. He's a vice president at the bank. He's making two hundred two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Is he also black elite or at least he thinks he is right? Well, here's the thing with any organization, black or white, sociologically speaking, you have your inner circle. Those are the vanguards of that the circle mm-hmm. is that elitist. Those are the unknown faces of the black elite. They are the ones who constantly remind the news of what. Okay, that's in any organization. But you also hey, doc- have your Dr. Oliver. Johnson, you're going a little in and sure. out, but let's try it right there. Go ahead. Okay. So you also have your outer circle. So your inner circle, that's that upper echelon. That's the crust. Right. But the outer circle, those are the new members, those who join over time who are not necessarily descendants or homegrown relatives of those who've been there from the beginning. So your old school and your new school. Right. Now, your new school <laughs> bourgeoisie, they may be the bank executive. Uh, yeah. Okay. They may be the owner of a very successful company. But as important as defining who they are, you have to also do an analysis of the impact that they have had on the decline of progress in black America. You understand? In other words, the black elite has been extremely beneficial to the white power structure towards maintaining the status quo in black America because most people look at their successful people to determine what they should be thinking and what they should be doing. Dr. Johnson, I know you're astute enough for me to jump right in the middle and not forget you, not, not break stride. That's called vote blue, no matter who continue on. I'm sorry. I had to throw that in. Okay. Got you. (laughs) That's your black elite. That's your black elite telling you to vote blue, no matter who. Continue on. Sorry. 
<laughs> no, no problem. And, and related to that, the black bourgeoisie's main responsibility is to keep black people thinking that there's a way to evolve politically and economically without creating your own independent economic structures and to also not rebel against the government. So the elite's job is to tell the young black professional and the working class black man or woman, you can be just like me. It's not about racism. So they politically misinform the masses, and that is their essential worth to the white power structure. Now, let me say this, and I'll be quiet. The outer circle of the black elite, because the inner circle is that old crust, that consistent black conservative consciousness, the gatekeeper of the tradition. But the outer circle has undergone some changes. See, there's three groups within that outer circle that are extremely important to the white power structure. And those are your megachurch pastors. Those are your politicians. And those are your mainstream black leaders. Although they are towards the bottom of the black elite circle, they are nonetheless black elites. Mm -hmm. Over the past 20 years, we have seen a decline in the influence that the megachurch minister, the elected politician, and the mainstream black leader has had over black youth. As a result of that, the white power structure has now started recruiting entertainers and athletes to take their place. So you no longer have that strong Jesse Jackson, that strong Al Sharpton. You don't have that anymore. That Dr. King personality. Mm -hmm. You don't have that. So now rappers and actors and entertainers are now taking on a political responsibility role because you must have someone who can control the behavior and the political consciousness of black youth. Hmm. Attorney Graham. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just a, I, I'm listening to Dr. Johnson, and I know that from an intellectual standpoint, that <clears throat> it, well, without a doubt, it's definitely true that, that many companies and institutions have adopted um, rappers and, and entertainers and athletes. But the, the sad thing about it is there's no consistency because those people do have a great deal of money, but there's no consistency with which they um, will advise um, companies and advise black people in general because they're doing it for the money. They're there for the money. They're there for the exposure. And no one, I mean, it's rare that you even find entertainers that are embraced by, um, by, by the black elite because the black elite still, and I'm talking about the black upper class, the older, the older groups, um, they are without a doubt Democrats. And I mean, it, it's majority Democrats. These are not people that are trying to be white. These are not people that are trying to, you, you know, to be embraced by, um, by, by, by at segments of corporate America that they know are conservative. These are people who have their own traditions that have said, like, I mean, when I think about, like, my, my, my wife's debutante, I'm a cotillion or, or, or my cousins and various people, these are not people that are saying, like, okay, I or want my daughter, their parents didn't say I want my daughter to be a debutante because we want to be like white people. Because a lot of the institutions and, and organizations were created out of segregation because we weren't allowed to participate. And even though there were wealthy blacks, you know, who had their kids at Latin school or, 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 or wealthy blacks who had their um, um, sons at Harvard or their daughters at Radcliffe or Wellesley going back in time, they weren't trying to be white because we have a tradition. I mean, when you look at um, some of the, the old, I mean, we have, black, have had blacks at, at Harvard Law School since the 1870s. And I mean, so by the time I got to Harvard Law School, I was not saying, oh, I'm doing this because I want to catch up with, 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 with white people. I mean, there was plenty of white, you know. I got to jump people. in, Attorney Graham. Yeah. <laughs> and I have a question for the attorney as well at some point. <laughs> Uh, let's no, let's get sorry. to it because Dr. Johnson's been flirting with it. He's trying to go there, and I'm just sitting back letting him, letting you all go there. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, with our let me let me let no let, let, let me let, let me oh, let sure. me put this out there with respect to our black elite. Um, of Here's scope. my question. Go ahead. Here's my question for Attorney Grant. Yes, I, I have to push back when you say that the black elites are not trying to be white, that flies in direct contrast to their historical behavior. It also flies in direct contrast to some other scholars' works. E. Franklin Frazier, 
one of our great yes, sociologists who wrote the black bourgeoisie, right, Nathan yes. and Julia Hare, two of yes. our great black psychologists who worked who wrote Black Anglo-Saxons, even when you study the boule, when you study the talent attempt, there has always been an attempt to emulate the white social structure, the white that political That is not value. true. I just completely well, disagree. Let me ask you, that is not true. Hold on, hold on. Attorney, attorney. Hold on, let, attorney, attorney, hold one, on one second. Dr. Johnson, about true, one minute. On. Go ahead. Okay. If that is not true, why has there always been a light-skinned supremacy energy running through the black bourgeoisie. Why has it always been exclusive, okay? Meaning that they only allow a certain amount of people, those who emulate the white intellectual no, psychological the white, the the most, okay. and the white. They not do not. The they do, and well, you say they don't marry outside hey, their Dr. race. Hey, Dr. Johnson. I didn't say, I'm saying the litmus How many black bourgeois are, are married to white listen, women? Listen, I know the one. And, and when, and when they oh, hold on one second. Go ahead, Attorney they Graham. We have one minute. One minute to, to a break. Attorney Graham. Okay, I want to say, like, when I look at people like Earl Graves, who founded Black Enterprise and owns um, Pepsi Bottling of D.C., I look at people like Ken Chenault, okay. um, who was a CEO of American Express for 25, 30 years, Vernon Jordan, um, who, who's, um, who's been on every corporate board. He has There's a white wife. Vernon Jordan has a white wife. But hold on, Dr. Johnson. None of them have no. white wives. None Go ahead, Attorney Graham. None of them had white wives. None of them. The ones that Vernon I named. Vernon Jordan had a white said, wife. Oh, Dr. I Johnson. I know Vernon Jordan personally. I know his kids from both wives, and you're wrong. Alma, you're completely wrong. Alma go, go ahead, Attorney Graham. We have 30 seconds before we go to break. She, she went to Spelman and then Vassar. I know everything about these people's backgrounds and everything. So you may say a light skin and person. Jordan is, is a white yeah. woman. And, and Jordan is a white woman. All right, hold on one second. The cooks who are from Chicago and the dibbles who are from um from from, from All right. Chicago as well. Hey, uh, attorney Coast Graham, Coast Dr. Coast. Johnson, we need to go to break. But listen, I'll I let's. I wanted to move the conversation in a different direction. We're going to go to break. Attorney Graham, on the other side of the break, I'll give you a minute or so just to to get your point out, Dr. Johnson. Please uh, reserve yourself for a moment. Let me we'll let do, Attorney we'll Graham do, we'll speak, we'll and then we'll go from there. Yes, Please, sir. Dr. Johnson, you were going somewhere, and I want to get back on that track. We'll be right back. No Attorney Lawrence Otis Graham, Dr. Umar Johnson, we'll be right back. Attorney Graham, you were and trying to— I need to, to clarify something. I want to make sure that people know that Vernon Jordan's wife, who I've known for years, um, for, for over 40 years— um, is Ann Dibble. Um, Ann Dibble and her was born in Tuskegee, Alabama. She, you know, her, she, um, her father at uh, Tuskegee, and her father was head of the Tuskegee um, VA hospital, which is a black hospital. And her grandfather, her, her uncle, was Robert Taylor, who managed, who was an architect, who managed the Rosenwald um, estate, um, real estate in, in, in Chicago, and the Robert Taylor Homes development was built on the south side of Chicago. That is Ann Dibble Cook's background. She Thank is you. black. Her father is black. Her grandparents are black. Everyone in her, their family is black. Yes, she's light complexion, but Vernon Jordan was never married to a white woman. Ann Dibble Jordan is is un, un, unquestionably black and was also in Chicago links. I mean, like I could go through her co yeah. credentials. But yeah. Thank you. Attor- Thank you, Attorney Graham. We, we understand that. So you were sent, you were sharing something about, um, um, black upper, uh, black elite wanting to emulate. Well, I, I was saying that they're not trying to emulate the black. I mean, it depends. You're talking about nouveau people who, like, we don't even know where they're from. But I'm talking about people who have historically been um, supportive of black institutions, black organizations. Because I don't, con- I consider Ken Chenault, Vernon Jordan, um, Earl Graves. These are the people that I'm talking about. And there's nothing about them that's saying I want to be white. Um, you know, they, they, okay, yes, they sent their kids to, to Harvard and to, um, and to um, Yale and, and University of Pennsylvania, but there's no reason why the Ivy League should be exclusively for white people are wanting to go there. That, that means you want to be white or trying to be white. We have the creme de la creme already within the black community historically going back. And by the way, remember, Martin Luther King, you know, his, the Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, you look at people like Malcolm X, his kids, I grew up in, in, in Jack and Jill with, with, the, with the Shabazz kids, with, with Malcolm X's daughters. And, and my brother was a, was a, 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 was was the um, a escort for her when, when one of the daughters when they went to have their debutante cotillion. That's not because the Shabazz girls are yeah. trying to be white. I got These you. These were black cotillions. Hey, Attorney These Graham, I'd like to I'd like to have you back on another time and to break that down and go a bit deeper. Okay. 
but, absolutely. Yeah, Doctor Johnson, though you were headed somewhere. Let's. This is where I wanted to go, but you know, it's your show. <laughs> it's the two of your show, right? <laughs> so, Doctor Johnson, um, I want to talk more about the Black Elite and uh, what that looks like um, in today's uh, terms. And you started to say. Um, you started down that road, and then I think we got misdirected when you broke down the mega church, the uh, politically elected, and then the business leaders and lo- losing influence. And um, so what's the implication on that? So, And then you also said something about, you know, um, now the um, entertainers and rappers and actors um, have replaced those uh, traditional influencers and stopped right there. Absolutely. Well, first, I maintain my original point. I want to make that clear to the listeners. And Jordan is a white woman until I see proof of anything other than that. Going forward, forward. yes, she is. Yes, she was. I was on the Roland Martin show, and we were discussing interracial marriage. And even Roland Martin, who was also a member of uh, uh, Sigma Pi Phi, he even evoked Vernon Jordan's name as an example of a black man with a white wife. Roland Martin. Well, he's wrong, and you're wrong. Anyway, making the point. Well, I was on the interview, not you, sir. But anyway, and let's not be adversarial. Let's not be adversarial. I'm not adversarial towards you. No, I admire a lot of what you're saying. It's just an intellectual conversation. It's just an intellectual conversation. But I take issue with any black person who would dare say that the black elite doesn't want to be white. Their entire history has been one of imitating the social structure of white America. That is absolute nonsense. You couldn't even join most of those organizations if you wasn't of an, of a certain skin tone at one point, irregardless of your income. Now, with regard to the rappers and the entertainers replacing the mega church ministers, the politicians, and the mainstream leaders, that is critical for the maintenance of white supremacy and the perpetuation of the American status quo. I want to go back to something I said earlier. One of the main responsibilities of the black elite and the black bourgeoisie is to make sure they help perpetuate the status quo. That is why you have never seen them in any real and meaningful way do anything to destroy racism, white supremacy, discrimination, inequity. They are extremely silent and extremely hidden when it comes to issues that affect black people. Where is the black elite when we talk about mass incarceration? Where is the black elite when we talk about miseducation? Where is the black elite when we talk about gentrification? Where is the black elite when we talk about police genocide? Where is the black elite when we talk about access to wealth? For anyone to say that they are not trying to be white, that is a total misrepresentation of the history and the truth. All right. Well, I think uh, there's a distinction being made here, right? And and Dr. Johnson, I want to continue on on that pathway, and I want to get into more specifics. So, like, from a political standpoint, you know, I think you all get the sense of how I felt about this, like, vote blue no matter who. Uh, We talked about Jay-Z got a seat at the table in the NFL, and I'm just like, that was absolute nonsense. Are you going to say Oprah is not a black elite? And, and that, is she the richest black woman in America? Are we going to say Oprah is not a black well, elite because she's an of entertainer? She is. That's ridiculous. Of course she is. Of course she's of course a black she elite. And she don't come from old money. Oprah well, first is of all, generation I don't billionaire. define the black elite. I define the black upper class. That is not my, t- my term is not, my book is called Our Kind of People Inside America's Black Upper Class. Okay. Are I'm you a, saying Oprah is not a black upper class? Because you said, of course she is. Okay, you're looking for a way. Old money, though. Old money. You're looking for a way to criticize black people who have money or black people who have a great education. That is not the label. No, it's not a great education. I have a great education. Hold on one second, because we have to go to we have to go to break. Attorney Graham, Dr. Jarrett. Is she not black? What do you do for the people? What do you do for the people? Well, hold on. For the people. Hey, let me make a distinction. Dr. Johnson, I think your point is already is no well made. We're but talking about the same thing. There is no You're hating on black people because they succeeded. I'm not hating. Nah, uh, hold you, on. What have, we have to you go to break. And your five Sigma Pi no, family hold. done for black people? Yeah. All right. Hey, Dr. Johnson, Attorney Graham, we have to go to break. I think, though, we keep crossing over the tracks, right? I think it's one conversation to have, a, a you know, we're sort of discussing who um who 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 is part and parcel of the black elite and i think there are different levels to the black elite dr johnson you yourself sort of 
um, made delineations between the black elite. We talk about the upper crust, the outer crust, and so on and so forth. And I wanted to go more down that track, but sort of defining who's in it and what they're doing at the top, you know, of the totem pole. I mean, it'll just turn into, I mean, Oprah, you know, back and forth. Generous. Yeah, we have. To, I'm sorry, Attorney Graham, we have to go to break. <laughs> Welcome back to the WVON Morning Show. I am Attorney Ernest B. Fenton. And we have uh, two wonderful guests uh, that have been with us, and I, I really appreciate their share. Uh, Dr. Umar Johnson and uh, on the line now, Attorney Lawrence Otis Graham. He's the author of the book, Our Kind of People Inside America's Black Upper Class. So, Dr. Um, Attorney Graham. Yes, thanks so much for having me on. I've enjoyed being on with, with Dr. Johnson as well. Um, but I just wanted to point out that some of the things, when you look back at, I mean, my, um, newspapers like the Chicago Defender, which really defined, you know, um, the, the black the black people, what they were doing for the city of Chicago. And you look at people like um, Valerie Jarrett, um, whose, whose family obviously is very well known in Chicago and uh, how prominent they were. But a lot of what, what, what my goal was in writing our kind of people was not to distinguish between, you know, which blacks that are rich and which blacks that are not rich. It's not about money. It's not about attempting to be white, attempting to be Republican. Um, it was the, the goal of the same thing that W.E.B. Du Bois had, had, had written about with his talented tent. Many of these organizations, and like the Boule, the Link, Jack and Jill, they all have foundations where one-third of the money that they pay into Jack and Jill or the Boulay or the Lynx goes specifically to black um, projects. Black, um, and not like vaguely inner city, but specifically black people, African-American people, mm -hmm. and to support any kinds of programs that need to be supported. And that's true with all of these um, organizations that I've been talking about in every city. These are not organizations that just talk about their own wealth. They are also social service organizations. Right. Okay. Attorney Graham, how do we find your book? All that good stuff? Our kind of people, um, you know, it's, it's in every bookstore. It's on Amazon. Um, it's a New York Times bestseller as well as, as an um, Essence Magazine bestseller. And um, my newer book, um, The Senator and the Socialite, is about the first black U.S. senator um, who served a full term and his family. And I follow three generations of that. That's um, and, and a member of the club, many people know about that when I went undercover as a busboy at um, Country Club in Greenwich when, um, um, several years ago. You haven't, but, been, um, you haven't been busting any tables lately, have you? No, no. And the point of that was to point out that even, obviously, in the late 1990s, uh -huh. in, New, in, the, in the Northeast, there were still clubs that people talk about, you know, affirmative action is bad, affirmative action is necessary because their affirmative action is right there in those clubs where they use their own network to keep us out. It's called legacy. It's called exactly. legacy points. Absolutely. It's called daddy is the president. You know, they have all type of affirmative action, just different names, nomenclature. All yeah, right. Absolutely. Uh, yep. Attorney Lawrence Otis Graham. Thank you, sir. Have a great day. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank and you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Bye-bye. Uh, Dr. Umar Johnson, how are you, sir? Welcome back. All is well. <sighs> you were going down. Let's. I'd like to talk about, um, or matter of fact, you have some thoughts. If you have anything else you'd like to get out, because I well, know. Well, my major point was as important as it is to define the black elite, I also believe it's also important to look at what they have and have not done. For black people in America, you're talking about the economic, political and educational elite, and they have largely failed us. One of the points I was making earlier that contradicted the good attorney's point was that the central thesis of E. Franklin Frazier's book, Black Bourgeoisie, and I pray that all your listeners go and read that book, as well as Nathan and Julia Hare's Black Anglo-Saxons, the central thesis is that they have abandoned black America and that they have tried to emulate and imitate white America. That but but who, are, who are we talking point. about when we're talking about the black elite? And, and or is it necessary to make a distinction between sort of that upper crust, that old money, and then this new money, this new black elite? That's a great question. To me, the only difference between the inner circle, which is the old money, in the outer circle, which is the new money, is the amount of power and influence that they wield within their world and within society as a whole. 
You understand? So there's a difference yeah. in power. There's a difference in influence. But in terms of abandoning the black agenda, in terms of not giving back systematically to attack our problems, see, one of the things that black elites love to talk about is how much they give, how much they donate. But you're not funding fights against our major problems. So what you're putting some children through college? Uh, so what? that you are building some homes for some homeless people, but you're not doing anything to attack the problems that cause those types of crises. And that's the point that I want to make. It's not about paying for scholarships. How are you funding the fight against mass incarceration, the fight against miseducation, the fight against gentrification? And that's where you see the black bourgeoisie has been missing in action. Yeah, I think um, I, up to your point, and I don't want to, you know, try to build on your point, but just to your point, I think oftentimes and um, part of the quote unquote black elite agenda uh, parallels the same as the liberal agenda. So you have these white liberals who make themselves feel good, if you will, by donating some money or adopting a black baby. But Absolutely. in form, they are supporting the movement. But in substance and in spirit, they are actually not. And it really doesn't move us forward. It just looks good. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Seven, seven, three, five, nine, one, sixteen, ninety seven. Your book, Dr. Johnson, any books you have that you'd like to? Uh, yes. Uh, Black Parent Advocate, uh, which is my new book, The Art of War for Dealing with America's Public and Charter Schools. We did release that book in Chicago the first uh, stop on the tour was Chicago back in September. I will be coming back to Chicago at some point. I don't have a date yet to do the Black Parent Boot Camp training, which is a 12-hour, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., everything you need to know, intensive seminar for Black parents. Yeah, I wanted to ask Attorney Graham, and I'll have him back on, but I'll, I have a sense of what you'll, you know, what your position is, but I don't know how you'll say it, which uh, matters. Um, so what do you care if you will, or what is the benefit of value or value of um, we have another black billionaire or uh, this person is the first CEO of this Fortune 500 company or we have a black vice president in Kamala Harris? Well, the point to that is that they are exclusive and a part of the exclusivity of the black elite is to show themselves to the white power structure in such a manner that suggests that, yes, we are black, but we are a different kind of black. The black elite is nothing more than the 21st century evolution of the House Negro. Nothing more. And it evolved from that. It literally evolved. <laughs> if you look at the evolution of the black elite going back to slavery, you will see that some of the first students who were accepted into the HBCUs were the children of the House Negroes. There has always been this cream of the crop mentality amongst the black elite where they don't represent the black community, but they stand out as an exception to the black community. And that is why they are so dangerous. Yeah. Let's go to Marty on line three. If you can hold on, Dr. Johnson, if you have to go, let sure, us know. Sure. All right. Marty, how are you? Welcome to the show. You know, I want, I want to first have Dr. Umar give me a call because I'm going to show him how it works in Chicago for real. And, and you can reach me at 312. Go ahead, Marty. You're on the you're on air. But go ahead. What's your yes. yes, yes. But I want to. Can, can I have Dr. Umar give me a call? We'll take your information. You have a com, you something okay, else yes, other than yes, that. Yes, yes, yes. So breaking down what you guys are talking about, there's a little community down on Cottage Grove where Dr. Finney used to live. Right private little neighborhood is mentioned in our kind of people's book. But when you talk about the black elite, you have to do your studies on the business leadership council. Are you aware of the business leadership council? You uh, have one minute, Marty, 30 okay. seconds. So the, the business leadership council and its connection to the uh, uh, civic committee of the commercial club. Now business leadership council is all the rich black folks and, and the elite and rich black folks. And the, the other one is the, um, the civic committee commercial club, rich white folks. They work in conjunction with one another to do exactly what 
uh, Umar Johnson just said. They work to keep us controlled and contained. And when you look at what, who's being jacked and everything, you know, those are the people who are reaching, who are calling out the Jewel Alphantants and all of them. These are the connected uh, uppity black folks in this city that, that are gatekeepers of white supremacy of Chicago. Right. And so a lot of what you see happening when it comes to mass incarceration, and they're not saying anything. These people receive contracts yeah. and everything. Right. So thank, uh, thank you. Marty. Can I give you a couple members? <clears throat> no, no. Thank you. It's 17 after the hour. I'd like to make a distinction on the other side and have you respond to it, Dr. Johnson. Sure. Uh, between all of, you know, with respect to all of this. We'll be right back. Traffic and weather's up next. Dr. Umar Johnson is, is on the line with us. Dr. Johnson, is it is it possible to have um, a foot in both worlds, if you will? Is it possible to be a black elite and both have a concern and care about the black community? and want acknowledgement or acceptance or um, access to white America and its fruits. I think that the Bible says it best when it quotes Jesus Christ as saying a man cannot serve two masters. I do think you have had black elites through history who have tried to do just that, and ultimately they end up failing at one or the other because it's difficult. Once the American white power structure sees that you have any degree of loyalty to your own in-group, then they will seek to punish you, as they did with a Bill Cosby and with others who have fallen from grace. I think W.E.B. Du Bois is a good example of a black bourgeoisie who has had a foot in both worlds, but you saw how that ended. He ultimately renounced his American citizenship. <laughs> <laughs> moved to Ghana, and that is where he died and where he is buried. And I don't think a lot of black people realize that the father of the black aristocracy, the father of the talented 10th, gave up his American citizenship and moved to Africa because that is what America did to W.E.B. Du Bois. Once they saw he was no longer loyal to the maintenance of the power structure, they tried to destroy him, and he needed to leave the company. On the other hand, you have Johnny Cochran, the late Johnny Cochran, yeah. who I believe is an example mm. of what a black elite should be. Although he had the money, he had the power, the education, the career, but Johnny Cochran dedicated himself to the liberation of black people, pro bono defending Geronimo Pratt, pro bono investigating what America owes to Africans in the form of reparations for slavery. So Johnny Cochran, and there's a few others, there's always mm -hmm. exceptions. But systematically, the black bourgeoisie has betrayed black America. Yeah. So uh, Cassius Clay had to become Muhammad Ali and they stripped him. Right. You, you have to die. You have to be you have to be prepared to die on that mountain. And I sort of had you that thought. In, yeah, you have to be prepared. I, I, you know, prior to going into break, that's the question I wanted to ask you. And I sort of kicked it around while we were on break. And I sort of concluded um, in the same way that you did, because at some point. I mean, you, yeah, you can't serve two. you can't serve two masters. And and what the conclusion we came to is like, ultimately, when the pressure you're going to have to choose. And uh, unfortunately, oftentimes, it seems like they choose um, the white acceptance over the movement. And that's part of the problem. Oh, right. They absolutely do. And the other point, too, although you still have that old inner circle of the black aristocracy, we have to realize that there's been a degree of transformation. They still exist. They still have their money. They still have their power. But in today's black America, the argument could be made that the megachurch minister and the black entertainer are far more important to the maintenance of the American power structure than are the traditional black elite circles. And I think because of that, we're going to see a lot more attention paid to the megachurch minister and to the entertainer. You already see they're the ones who are being put out front to represent the consciousness and the thinking of the young black America right now. So although they're there, their influence over black America is not what it used to be. It is now the entertainer and the megachurch minister. Yeah, let's go to Eddie on line four. Eddie, how are you? Hey, Brother Fenton and Brother brother John, pleasure and honor to talk to both of you as always. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Johnson 100 uh, percent. The old elite, black bourgeois elite, is definitely uh, what he has said. And I would even go as far as to say 
if that had been fully articulated, that they have been misleading black people and leveraging us for, uh, to the Democratic Party. Um, and I, I really have a problem with that. And, and, and allowing us to ask and demand for nothing in return for our allegiance to, to one political party. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess it begs a larger question. And this is something that I'll thank you, Eddie. All right. And Dr. Johnson, you may, if you, you know, <clears throat> my experience is that when I was in law school, right. And I was introduced to the black elite. Like I didn't know that this world existed. And uh, Dr. Johnson, my immediate response was try to sort of bring together the black people and talk about how when we became lawyers, we would create this law firm that's of Ivy League attorneys, if you will, to use that badge as leverage to position us to um, to scale up and uh, represent our people and have a law firm that sort of we can turn to not a black law firm per se, but you get my point. And um, I, I'll never forget that. I never told this story. And then to see the pushback from black folk. And then if you fast forward three, four, five years later to watch where those same black folk we, that I sat at the table with my first year of law school with all these, you know, thoughts and ideas in my head about look at all these black Ivy League folk who are going to be, you know, graduates from Harvard. And, and uh, then to watch where they went and worked and then to look at where they are now. This is what I found, even from those who come from humble beginnings. When the white man offers uh, a black man a seat at the table, no matter how humble his beginnings may be, it seemingly appears that most, if not all, you know, takes his food, eats off his plate. And um, and it bothers me. <laughs> it bothers me. I just wanted to share that with everybody. So that goes to Dr. Johnson's point as well. When you try to serve those two gods and they offer you up that money. And when they tell you how important you are, when they make you the head Negro. Uh, very few of us resist that temptation. That's why Muhammad Ali is Muhammad Ali as one example. All right. Absolutely. Which is why I always say <laughs> most black people are not fighting for liberation. They're not fighting for equality. Most black people in America are fighting to be accepted by the oppressor. Yeah. 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 Brother Mark. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Umar. Good morning. Hello? Yes. Hey, yes. Dr. Umar, I just want to say welcome back to Chicago. I remember in 2010, you was on the uh, Can Access uh, channel with Dr. Dua, with Brother Dua, Dawa. And I want to say, ever since then, I've been listening to you, brother, ever since I got your book, The Psycho-Academic Psycho Holocaust. And you said on page nine, you said that countless lives have been destroyed by invisible glass ceilings that have been placed upon our children's heads by outside. And then you had made a, a point when you mentioned, you said uh, also about our, why our young black uh, brothers don't uh look at athletes and entertainers for role models because in their everyday life, that isn't an uh, athlete or entertainment for them. Uh, wait a minute, I'm kind of getting mixed up here. Yeah. But you were saying when the black brothers become a doctor, the white supremacy uh, gives him, once he received that merit, they move him out of the neighborhood where the young, younger brothers cannot see the example to become a doctor. So that leaves him with only being looking at athletes or entertainers or rappers yeah and i just want to say brother uh oh my welcome back to chicago thank, thank you sir keep on and talk thank about you sir food. okay i'm gonna let dr johnson uh wrap it up um you can wrap it up we only have about a minute now or I'll, I'll allow you to wrap it up on the other side of the break how about that we can do the other side Okay, thank you. Dr. Umar Johnson is going to wrap it up on the other side of the break. This is the WVON Morning Show. I am attorney Ernest B. Fenton. Um, I see your call, Brother Hall, Ron. Give Dr. Johnson an opportunity to uh, wrap it up with us. Dr. Johnson, welcome. Uh, yes, sir. I just wanted to let the people know that I will be coming back to Chicago at some point for the 12-hour Black Parent Boot Camp training. Also, we're still making the renovations for the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. If all goes well... We will be having a grand opening conference and celebration late August. So be um, be on the lookout for that. And please continue to donate and support the Academy. Go to DrUmarJohnson.com, and they can also reach me by telephone, 
215-989-9858. Again, that's 215-989-9858. Happy Black History Month. All right. All right, sir. All right, sir. Thanks for joining us. Really appreciate no it. No problem. Take care, brother. Yeah, Dr. Umar Johnson dot com. That's Dr. Umar Johnson dot com. Thank you.